Hello YouTube. Um, I changed my name to Francionista. It's a bit of an inside joke, and um, but anyway, it's it's better to have a, a moniker on YouTube. I think most people have them. So um, it's basically uh, this is my first video of six um, that I plan to do on the six principles of the abolitionist approach to animal rights. And um, I'm going to start with principle one in this video. Before I begin, I would just like to um, say that I really re would hope that people would take um, these videos and these concepts at face value and on their own merit, not be not on who said them or who's coming up with them or um, the fact that you didn't come up with them. You know, perhaps um, ego gets in the way, and um, there's a lot of ego, uh, and I, I suffer from it. So. I think it's selfish and egotistical to not consider something just because you didn't come up with it. Well, I'm really sorry that you didn't come up with it, but neither did I. But if you just read the words and listen to it um, and just judge it for its own merit, um, I think you'll find that um, they are uh, pretty sound and there's a reason why so many people are turning on to these concepts. Um, okay, so um, today the first principle. I'm going to read it from the website and I'll also link. The abolitionist approach to animal rights maintains that all sentient beings, human or non-human, have one right, the basic right not to be treated as the property of others. So think about what that means. The basic right not to be treated as the property of others. Essentially the key words in the first principle are sentient and property. Um, when it comes to property, if property is sentient, uh, it's pretty much slavery. Uh, when you think about human beings who were um, property um, during the times of legalized widespread slavery, which l lasted for thousands of years in our history, but the, the one that we most are familiar with, of course, is the um, abolition of race-based slavery in England and the United States of America and other places as well, but mostly we um, learn about those history, the, those historical movements. And um, so there was a recognition, a recognition that it was wrong for these humans to be property. It was wrong for them to be slaves. And uh, once we recognized that, we worked to abolish it. And um, that is what the first principle of the abolitionist approach to animal rights is, is to acknowledge and recognize that sentient beings, human or non-human, uh, have the right not to be treated as the property of others. And until we address that and dismantle and abolish their property status, they have no rights. They are merely things for us to use. And that, as we know, is wrong. It is actually immoral. Uh, we recognize that when it comes to human beings. Uh, the difference is that the abolitionist approach to animal rights extends that right to all sentient beings. So, as an advocate, uh, once I took this on board myself, think about when you're advocating for these non-humans or think about if you're a vegan or if you're not a vegan. If you agree that sentient beings have the right not to be property, then first of all you need to be vegan. Um, and um, if, you, if you don't agree with it, then why not? Um, if, you're, if you're vegan and you don't agree with it, I can't believe it. But sadly, it, there are a lot of vegans who, who apparently don't, don't believe that, and I'll explain why in a second. Um, I guess most of my videos, just like my podcast, is mostly aimed at advocacy and um, trying to turn on people to um, advocate for abolition. Uh, and um, I try to be a vegan educator in my community. Uh, teaching people about veganism. Uh, I went vegan late in life, so uh, anyone can do it. But um, I am going to just start out with the six principles because I think they, res they resonate with anyone who just gives them a moment's thought. So um, as an advocate for 
non-humans, for example, if you are advocating for their welfare, um, in other words, you're concentrating on the treatment of the property, saying that um, the problem is the treatment, the problem is that the cages aren't big enough, or that they're in cages, we need to get them out of the cages, that's the problem. We need to torture them less painfully, um, that's the problem. Um, you're actually perpetuating, continuing, reinforcing the notion that there are things for us to use. Not only are you not challenging the fact that they're property, you're actually reinforcing it and endorsing it. Think about it. Think about that. So when I advocate on behalf of anyone, um, I advocate, if, if they are, the, for example, in the human context, when we're talking about the sex slavery industry, for, for one example, of where human beings, sentient beings, are property, they're actually owned and sold and used as property, not legally though, unlike the non-human animals, um, not legally, but illegally, but they are still property. My goal as an advocate, and I believe all of the world's goal, is to abolish the slavery. It's not to get better treatment for the sex slaves, it's not to um, get air conditioning in the rooms of the sex slaves. It's to eliminate sex slavery because we recognize that it's an immoral institution and you can't advocate for the rights of, of property. Now, because human beings aren't recognized legally as property, it's a slightly different situation for them because it's, we've already abolished the property status of, of human beings legally. We don't, we do not accept it. Um, we don't, um, it's not a legal, it's not a universal legal um, uh, mandate the way it is with non-humans. So I don't want to get too confusing about that, but it's just more of a conceptual thing with regard to when you open your mouth and speak out against an injustice, are you actually perpetuating it because of what you're saying, or are you actually challenging it? So when it comes to veganism, when it comes to non-human animals, if you're focusing on how they're treated and saying that that's the issue, and you're working with the animal industries to try to get quote, better treatment for them, that's using the word better in a word I would never use it now that I know the reality for them. They are still horrifically tortured no matter what and they all go to the same slaughterhouse when you're talking about animals that we use for food and that we use for clothing um, and um, animals that we use for um, uh, sport or, or um, animals that we use for vivisection or something like that. Um, even wild animals, they're all legally property. That's why we choose who's going to be um, protected and we choose who's going to be eliminated when it comes to wild animals based on our definition of whether they're a pest property animal or whether they're a protected um, property animal. Um, pets are property. Um, all the animals are legally property and they're not persons under the law. So the first thing that the abolitionist approach to animal rights needs to get into people's brain, just like the abolitionist approach to um, the abolitionist, sorry, just like the abolitionist movement um, against race-based slavery um, uh, was that we need to abolish slavery. We need to abolish the property status. It's absurd to talk about rights of property because property has no rights. So if you're, if you're looking for something to say uh, when, when you, when with regard to the situation for non-human animals, the thing to do is advocate for veganism. The thing to do is be vegan, first of all, because you're rejecting the property status with your actions. I know plenty of vegans who then turn around and reinforce it by talking about the size of cages and things like that, which does not challenge their status as property. Think about it. It doesn't challenge their status as property. And if you agree that they should have the right not to be property, then why are you not challenging that? Why not? That's my question to you. And um, so I urge you, with regard to this particular principle, um, read Animals, Property and the Law by Gary Francione because that's real life case studies of the reality of their property status and the illusion of the so-called protection that is given them under the law. And um, I hope that when you read that book you will 
realize uh, what you're actually doing when you're advocating for better quote treatment which is not better it's not we wouldn't use the word better um, when it comes to humans um, with the what the way we do when it comes to non-humans um, they talk about getting rid of the worst abuses it's it's a it's a use of the language that is actually quite speciesist because it's all horrific abuse horrific abuse and they all go to the same slaughterhouse they all go to the slaughterhouse all of them or they get slaughtered in the backyard so think about that that's the key and the reason why they get slaughtered is because they're property and um, I'm sure I don't I don't have done a lot of investigating into the the use of animal for sports um, you know for like um, rodeos or bullfighting but I imagine knowing what I know about like racehorses for example um, they'll go to a slaughterhouse too when we're done using them for entertainment okay all of the animals used for vivisection after being tortured their entire lives get um, generally get put to death or they get put if they're lucky um, and that's using the word lucky in a way that is also very sus um, um, you know suspect uh, they go to some kind of retirement village this is I've heard of the chimpanzees I mean after we've finished using them but if we want to we can just pull them right back out and use them again and um, they are still our property they, we still own them so we can choose when they live we choose when they die we choose what happens to them so um, the first thing we need to do the first thing we need to concentrate on as a movement just like the abolitionist movement against human slavery is abolishing the property status and we're not going to do that until we first of all acknowledge that their property realize it's true it's not something that we're making up to be mean it's a reality and number two help us work towards abolishing it and you know what veganism does that veganism does that because vegans don't use animals we don't use animal property okay so at the very least we are removing your first of all you're removing yourself from the custom base of the consumer base of the people who are using animals as property and also you're creating an ethical movement that recognizes excuse me, that recognizes that it's wrong. So veganism is the moral baseline of the abolitionist approach to animal rights and it is the first step in the recognition that sentient beings have the right not to be property. There's many, many, many other things that we need to be that we, we need to do as well, but veganism is the first step and we need more vegans. So adv advocate for veganism. Don't advocate for bigger cages. Don't advocate for less torture or for them to be slaughtered on Australian soil instead of Indonesian soil it means nothing for them fundamentally okay it really doesn't you know even in New Zealand we have these massive long campaigns from SAFE who is the animal welfare group of New Zealand and um, nothing is being done uh, about the about the so-called um, cage-free egg campaign uh, they're still uh, in the cages and the farmers will do it when they're good and ready because they're property owners and we still have all these consumers out there buying the eggs so and then we have all the animal advocates reinforcing the fact that they're things for us to use it's just it's just that we should use them nicely so um, I urge people to consider this concept on its face value please just read it with an open mind and think about what that means with regard to how you live as an individual and what you say when you advocate for others. Thanks for watching. I'll be back with uh, number two in this series, which will cover the uh, second principle of the six principles of the abolitionist approach to animal rights. Bye for now.